All right. Point 15. I got into trouble with this one. Many are called to be faithful, but few are chosen. The latter will choose to be faithful and be rewarded commensurately. <clears throat> when I gave this sermon, I think I got set up because the class went to the pastor and didn't like the, the sermon or the teaching. I, and the pastor worked with me point for point for point. <clears throat> and so he kicked them all out of his house. And then I kind of lost fellowship with the church, not with the pastor, though. But you got to teach it right, regardless of the results. Introduction. Objectors to free grace salvation and eternal security point to Matthew chapter 22 as a proof text for the false doctrine that one's lifestyle must reflect some unspecified amount uh, and type of faithful works. Otherwise, one is not saved at all or will lose one's salvation and be cast into the lake of fire. Wow. How do you figure that one out? More sins? A bigger lake of fire? Here's how the passage reads. Matthew 22, 1 to 14. And Jesus answered and spoke to them, <clears throat> again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Sound familiar back Old Testament times? Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat and livestock, and all butchered, and everything is ready. They're all butchered. Dinner is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention. He went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. Wow. Why didn't you just send a note, a polite note, I'm not coming. But the king was enraged and sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Pretty big king, a bunch of cities. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go out there to the main highways, and as many as you find there, anybody, invite to the wedding feast. And those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. <coughs> what else? And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came back in, came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw their man not dressed in wedding clothes. Now he's coming in to look at the guests, not there to judge. But the guy wasn't wearing dressing, uh, uh, wedding clothes. From those days, you were given wedding clothes to wear, by the way. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him out into the outer darkness outside of the wedding banquet hall. And that place, there shall be, in that place, there should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Boy, there's a lot of stuff in here to look at. A careful examination of this parable provides the following parallel statements. Just as the king is holding a wedding banquet for his son, so there will be a wedding banquet in the kingdom of heaven on earth. Which New Testament revelation teaches that God the Father will hold a wedding banquet for his son, the Lord Jesus Christ? By the way, there are uh, places in the Old Testament which speak of uh, a a banquet, a kingdom banquet. There's only one kingdom uh, on earth. The eternal kingdom. And so this must be the one. They're very similar. There's no co contradiction. There's all corroboration. Just as a specific group of individuals were at first invited to attend, so there, those of the nation Israel were invited to be part of the banquet held on earth during our Lord's millennial rule. Just as the first group rejected the invitation and attacked and murdered the king's servants, so the Jews rejected the Son of God as Messiah, attacked and murdered his prophets, disciples, and other faithful believers. Just as the king sent his armies, destroyed the murderers, and set their fire on, city on fire, so God decreed and history showed that Rome, A.D. 22, A.D. 20, would likewise send an army, destroy millions of Jews, and burn the city of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Sorry about that. 
got my dates mixed up. Luke 19, 41 to 43. And just as the king thereupon extended his invitation to all who would come to his son's banquet from all over, so our Lord then extended his invitation to accept him as Messiah, Savior, to whosoever will believe in him as Savior. Just as those who did not accept the king's invitation to, did not attend the banquet of their own volition, so those who did not accept God's invitation to believe in his son unto eternal life will not attend the wedding banquet of their Messiah. They weren't invited. They won't attend. Especially in view of those to whom our Lord was speaking, the Jews, who felt that it would be their exclusive destiny to take part in the kingdom banquet, but not in the terms that the Lord offered. <clears throat> Just as the individual who chose not to wear the proper wedding garment was bound and cast out of the banquet itself, so those who are not wearing the proper attire representing faithful lives will be likewise cast out of the Lord's wedding banquet. Even believers, both to experience weeping and gnashing of teeth at their utter disappointment at their great loss of fellowship. You think we're going to lead up to loss of salvation? Nope. But neither were cast out of their respective kingdom. Just as God invites all to believe and be saved, but only those who are chosen by him will be saved. So God invites all believers to be faithful, but only those who are chosen by him will be faithful. Interesting. Just as every tear will be wiped away, and there will be no more sorrow when God finally recreates the new heavens and the new earth, so there will be a season of sorrow and regret beforehand for those who did not serve the Lord faithfully. And finally, just as the faithful will enter heaven with maximum capacity to serve the Lord and enjoy eternity, so the unfaithful believer, the unfaithful believer, believer, will be limited in such capacities to the point where they might not be very happy. Continue to study this passage. Matthew 22 gives you good reasons. Weeping and gnashing of teeth not limited to hell. Their life circumstances make you weep and gnash your teeth. And outer darkness. The outer darkness back in the old days, a wedding banquet was well lit. Especially inside with all the candlelights and everything else for this wonderful day. On the outside, there weren't any street lighting. lighting, And, and you could practically see the back of your hand at, at, at night time when there weren't any street lights. So keep that in mind, the imagery there. Uh, be careful how you interpret it. B, point B, Colossians 2.18 to Colossians 3.4. You have commentary on these verses. Let no one cheat, deprive, defraud you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men? These aren't everlasting things to go by. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed, self-made or would-be religion, false humility, humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Here we are at Colossians 3.1. And since you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, literally is manifested, then you also will appear with him in glory. Second coming will be with him. Paul has declared in chapter 2 that believers are not to value the elementary principles of the world of temporal things, i.e. the sinful doctrines of men, whereupon in chapter 3 Paul declared 
that since believers were raised up with Christ in the sense of being identified with and benefiting from what was accomplished by our Lord's death, burial, and resurrection, eternal life in all spiritual matters that pertain to that, they are to seek those eternal things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. For believers have died with Christ in the sense of benefiting from that death unto forgiveness of sins unto eternal life. So the believer's life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, is manifested, then they also will appear with him in glory. With the context of chapter 2 in mind, that, that believers are not to value their elementary principles of the world and of temporal perishable things and matters that will pass away in time, the doctrines of men, false wisdom, indulgences of the flesh, since believers are, were raised with Christ in the sense of having the position of being identified with his resurrection, with having received the benefit of eternal life in all spiritual matters that pertain to that, they are to seek those things which are from above, spiritual, eternal, and not seek those which are from below, which are physical and temporal, which overwhelm us, this temporal life. We have our six senses. Got to get to Scripture to override those things that are of lesser importance, especially finite and long, uh, short-lived. For it is above, in the heavenly realms, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of, of God. The believer is thus to center his life upon the ascended, glorified Jesus Christ at his seat of divine authority, having defeated the forces of evil and death, having paid for the sins of the whole world, so that all men may choose to express a moment of faith alone in Christ alone in his sacrifice for them and have eternal life. The practical application of this ongoing command is to endeavor every day to carefully study the inspired words of God's word, which have eternity in view better than anything else, which convey the teachings of Jesus Christ for us to learn and follow in order to enhance our temporal and eternal lives. The temporal is very hard because of our six senses and our attachment to it, because we still have an attachment. It's in nature. Thus we may focus our temporal lives upon the eternal words of the Savior, which endeavor, in effect, is tantamount to seeking those things which are above where Christ is. So we are to see it, see to it, that one's interests are centered in Christ, that one's attitudes, ambitions, and whole outlook on life are molded by Christ's relation to the believer whose position is in Christ. So one's allegiance to him is to take precedence over all earthly allegiances. The, the verb is a present imperative, suggesting a, a continuing action. Keep on seeking. Therefore, Colossians 3, 1-4 is saying, you, the believer, is to have set, is to have set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Well, that's easier said than done. For you, all those who believed in Jesus Christ, died with him, because he died for you, and thus you are credited with his payment for your sins and are forgiven because you believed in him. And your life is hidden with Christ in God because at that moment of faith alone in Christ alone, you were placed in Christ in his body. So when Christ, who is therefore our life, appears, our those that believed in him, then you will also appear with him in glory. That is, when he comes again in his second coming, we will surely be with him in glory. We've been raptured up. Rewarded according to our faithfulness at the judgment seat of Christ and brought back with him. With our glory showing, experiencing it. What a joy. Note that the description of Christ as seated at the right hand of God is another implied rejoinder to those who are seeking to diminish Christ's role as mediator. Inasmuch as the right hand of God is a metaphor for the place of supreme privilege and divine authority. Now, 1 Peter 1, 3-4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's my point of view. At least I should have that. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, an eternal one, and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. All these passages we can go into on heaven, the physical heavens, and so on. 
many, many more.